But today, let us just take today and appreciate the day that the Lord has made. What a gift. What a wonderful, beautiful gift that the Lord has given to us. And that's why we're here today at Hope Center of Christ. And so, Lord God Almighty, we just come because we want to worship you and we want to thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the hope that springs from today, yes, yes. the hope that springs from your forgiveness for yesterday, the hope that springs from your promises for tomorrow. Yes. But Lord, right here, right now, we just find the hope and the blessing of sitting at your feet. Thank you. We open our hearts and our minds to you. Speak to us, Lord. Yes. Fill us with your presence. Holy Spirit, bring the gift of peace, joy, yes. love, yes. patience, goodness, kindness. And for all of our brothers and sisters who came today, who need a fresh burst yes. of your spirit, who need a fresh burst of hope, Holy Spirit, surprise them now. Surprise them with you. Amen. Amen. Sheila, well, Psalms 41 through 3 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on a rock. He established my steps, and he's put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear the Lord and will trust in the Lord. Yeah. Jesus, the very thought of you brings hope, brings yeah. healing, brings peace, brings joy. Yeah. Hallelujah! Come on! We're here to worship the Lord. Woo. Woo. Yeah. Worship Him this morning. Jesus, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the 
Has he picked you up? Yes. Has he turned you around? Yes. Has he put your feet on oh. solid ground? Well, if you haven't experienced that, he wants to do that for you today. Amen. Amen. He wants to give you a new life filled with joy and hope and peace. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Psalms 1, my favorite. That's my favorite Psalms. 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the place with sinners, nor sits in the seat with the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who brings forth its fruit in its season and, the, and his leaf will not wither and whatever he does will prosper. Do you want to be like a tree this morning? Come on, can you stick your arms out like this?
because he wants to make you prosper yes. in everything you do. Yes. You just got to meditate on him day and night, night and day, amen, yes. and follow his way, and he wants to make you happy. I think that's the most beautiful part. God wants to make us happy every day of our lives, amen? Yes. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, Psalms 21, uh, Psalm, Isaiah, sorry, Isaiah 8, 1 through 3 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, two to cover the face, two to cover the feet, and two were for flying. And they called out to one another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory.
Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, or to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
especially in the city of Orange, if you would stop by and visit with us. Also, we have a connection card that we fill out here in Hope Center of Christ. Those of you that are viewing us via internet, write us. Let us know how we can pray for you. 
Also, for those that are here with us today, friends, new friends, and members, don't walk this life all alone. No man is an island. We would love to pray for you. We would love to hold you up in prayer. So please take time and fill out this connection card. Let us know your prayer praises, how the Lord has blessed you, and also how we can walk alongside and be an intercessor with you as you are praying for a certain outcome, for a certain victory in your life. Also, at this particular juncture of worship, we prepare for our tithes and our offerings. And I would just like to take a moment and to wish our keyboardist a great happy birthday. Albert. All right, Albert. Albert, happy birthday. Can we give him a happy birthday on three? You know, one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Albert. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> also, we want to encourage everyone to follow the leadership of our pastor who encourages us to always practice a daily devotion in your life. Also, perform a weekly worship, either in your home or this could count as one of the weekly worship by being here at Hope Center. Also, we want you to, want to encourage you to get involved with your with, with the uh, uh, community. Get involved with your community and serve somewhere in your community at least once a month. And right now, there's so much human trafficking going on, you can probably volunteer for some organization that's uh, trying to help those uh, young people that are being trafficked, uh, even some of the older people are. So there's a lot of pain, a lot of hurt out there where we believers in Jesus Christ can step into the middle of that and to help bring someone out or to bring comfort to them. So it's always a way to serve. Yesterday we served the community with the chili van. We served over uh, maybe 120 bowls of chili yesterday to the seniors. We gave away sanitation kits and so forth and so on. And they were really thankful. And I like to thank the volunteers of Hope Center of Christ that came out yesterday. Also, our weekly Bible studies. We are having, God hasn't skipped a beat, has he? We are able to continue our weekly Bible studies. The Women of Hope, they are meeting at uh, Mr. and Mrs. Joe Kahapea House at 2744 East Sherman. That's S-H-E-R-M-A-N Avenue in the city of Orange. And Mr. and Mrs. Paul Lips have opened their homes up to the men band of brothers to meet at their home at 819 North Elmwood. That's E-L-M-W-O-O-D Street. Be nice. <laughs> and Katie is still waiting to be, be announced, right, Katie? Uh, the young people are... Uh, Katie is leading our young people in Bible worship. I see about four or five young people right there, Katie. Snatch them up. Yes. Uh, and the church parking, of course, we're doing great with the church parking. We know we like to leave the sidewalk area open for the handicapped or those that are having a problem, uh, you know, getting, getting into church so they won't have to walk from the... Uh, other parking space to over here. So let's try and keep those spaces open out front for them. A communion potluck. On February 1st, we are having our communion potluck. Uh, Susan has orchestrated this, Susan and Elizabeth. They have, or they have organized this. And, and so if you want to know whether you're bringing a dessert 
or whether you're bringing a main dish, see Susan or Liz, and they'll help you out on that. Okay, this says collect offering. <laughs> don't forget, don't forget. And you have a birthday? Michael has a birthday. Happy birthday, Michael. Happy birthday, Michael. <laughs> Happy birthday. And you know, if the pastor would allow me, one, two, three. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Michael. Happy birthday to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the abundance that you have given us, dear Heavenly Father, not just in monetary uh, gains, dear Heavenly Father, but in our health, in our mental state, our spiritual state, and so forth and so on, dear Heavenly Father. We just thank you so very much. And dear God, what you've given us, teach us how to give back to you, dear Heavenly Father, to build into your kingdom, to grow your kingdom, to help those that are less fortunate than ourselves, dear Heavenly Father. Use Hope Center of Christ and each and every one of its members to make a difference, Thank you. to make a difference in this world and so that Jesus Christ can be seen Thank through you. our speech, through our behaviors, dear Heavenly Father, and just through our being. Thank you, dear God, and we give you all glory, honor, and praises. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus saying to anyone, and he says, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, and he'll change your life.
Debbie, what a dear sister you are. You know, we're soul soulmates, right? I love how you lead us in worship and all that you give to us. You pour out your heart for us. And Carmel, one of my favorite songs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The Holy Spirit was just pouring out of every fiber of your being this morning. We all saw it. We all felt it. You know, this is a Holy Spirit-filled church, so get used to it. You know, it's just who we are. We're not going to change. The Lord has told us, this is who you are, and we will be true to who we are. We will be true to who God has created, because he's created people, as we know from the Bible, but he's also created institutions and organizations, and he creates churches. And this is one of his creations, a Hope Center of Christ. What a beautiful creation. And you are part of that, all of you. So thank you for being here today. Um, I'm just thrilled to be able to share with you a message that the Lord put on my heart this week for you. And I've got to tell you, I don't know if you know, but us poor pastors, when the Lord gives us a message to deliver, you may not know this, but the Lord puts us through the fire as we get ready for it. We usually have to work extra hard. We get assailed. And, and honestly, that's exactly what I saw. So beware, you know, if you're as a pastor, you guys need to be praying for us, first of all, because let's, let's just say today's not, this is not today's message because I don't want to give it away. But if I were praying, if I were preaching on patience, I probably would be assailed all week long and my patience would be tried and tried and tried. It's, it's, so at any rate, I have lived, I've had to live, I had to practice what I preach before I'm preaching it today. But it's a good, good message. And it's from the Lord. It's not from me. It's from his word. We're in this series of messages that we started for the new year called Tomorrow Starts Today. Yeah. Some people would say tomorrow started yesterday. And I would disagree. I would respectfully disagree. Because too often the things of yesterday hold us back and we let our tomorrows and our plans for tomorrows and our, our steps out of the boat, we let the, the hurts from yesterday, the pain and the disappointments from yesterday, the regrets from yesterday hold us back from pursuing today and tomorrow. So I would say that to, did tomorrow start yesterday? No, because we as Christians know that this is one of the most beautiful parts of the gospel message is that God sent his son Jesus, to free us from all of that past that holds us back. We are delivered. We are freed from it. We do not have to let it hinder anything we do from this point forward. That's a beautiful thing. So based on the, the Christian gospel, which I believe with every fiber of my being, does tomorrow start yesterday? No. Tomorrow start tomorrow. We talked about that a little bit last week. Well, if we want to wait till tomorrow because we're afraid to take that step today, we just might miss out altogether. So I would say tomorrow starts to tomorrow. No, I would say tomorrow starts today. It starts right now. So don't miss out on what God has for you today. 
this moment, right here, right now. So we've talked about the very first message we talked about. So how do we take advantage of this opportunity that God has given us that tomorrow starts today? Well, you know, I've given you all these Fs. And as a teacher, I do not mean the grade F, just some Fs as an alliteration to help you remember. They start with Fs, focus, focus forward. That was our first message. Forgetting all that stuff that behind, all those regrets and shames that can keep us from taking the courage to step out of the boat like Peter did. Peter not only stepped out of the boat, he stepped out onto the waves. And like I, uh, Jim Penner, who can't be here today, Pastor Jim, he, as he taught us, W-O-W, wow, stands for walking on water, right? And that story of Jesus walking on water, everybody knows that story. Even non-Christians know that story. But the part that I love about that story is that it was Peter who walked on the water. That means you and I. We can also walk on the water, but it wasn't just calm waters that Peter stepped out into. He stepped onto waves. So wow can also stand for walking on waves, not just walking on water, but walking on waves. Wow. And we can do that with the power of the Lord because we know that as long as we have the Holy Spirit to redeem us, because the enemy would like for us to lower our limits and our sights. We don't want to lower our sights to the enemy's level. We want to lift our sights. We want to lift our focus and our goals to God's height. I'm going to repeat that one more time. We want, with the power of the Holy Spirit, to lift our focus and lift our goals to God's height. Can't do it alone. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us do that. I can promise you that. You can try to do it on your own, but that's, that will just lead to all kinds of frustration, I suspect. And that's what I've experienced and seen over and over again. So that was week one. Week two, last week, we talked about not only do we focus forward and focus on faith, but, and focus on the face of Christ because that's what Peter learned to do. He had to, as long as he kept his eyes on Christ, he kept from sinking. And when he did begin to sink, all he had to do was cry out, Lord, save me. I don't know about you, but I do that throughout the week. If there's a time or a moment when I find myself being assailed by doubts or fears or lack of self-confidence or somebody's hurt my feelings and I feel myself start to sink, my emotions start to go down. I don't know about you. Anybody else ever have that experience? Oh, come on. Yeah, you do. I feel myself starting to go down. I feel myself starting to sink. And I do this. I say it out loud. I say, Lord, save me. Just like that. Don't forget that. Lord, save me. And boy, he does. He does. It's such a powerful, powerful tool just to cry out when you feel yourself sinking and those emotions starting to pull you down a little bit. Just cry out, Lord, save me. So last week we talked about the other F, focus on forgiveness. Because you see, one of the things that holds us back a lot of times, if you have found frustration, you've had dreams, you've worked toward them, you've tried to make steps, whether it be just in healing from, uh, it might be healing from a, a relationship, a past relationship. It might be recovery from addiction. We have people in here who have had tremendous success over recovery from addiction, but maybe you have struggled with it and you're still not seeing the success you want. And last week we talked about sometimes the things that are holding us back and keeping us from moving forward, the things that keep taking our focus and turning back and looking back where I was is lack of forgiveness. We need to forgive. We need to forgive others, and we need to forgive ourselves. We need to accept the forgiveness that Jesus gave us, like we sang about today. Hallelujah. We are forgiven. Past tense, take it, claim it, accept it. That was last week's message. Focus. Focus on forgiveness. Focus forward, week one. Focus on forgiveness, week two. Today is focus on the finish line. 
focus on that finish line. You know, scripture gives us three metaphors. It's that important. Whether you've realized it or not, it's important to focus on the finish line or God would not have given us in his word three metaphors for it. The first one we see is Jesus. Jesus gave us the first metaphor through the farmer. He said in Luke 9, verse 62, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the heaven, for the kingdom of heaven. My grandpa Schuler, he was a farmer. And my dad used to tell the story about how when grandpa, who plowed the old fashioned way, he plowed his field, he would take a bright red handkerchief and he would put it on a stake and he would bang it into the ground at the end of his furrow that he was where he was headed. And he learned that he had to keep his eye on that handkerchief at all times if he wanted to have a straight furrow. The minute he, he got distracted and looked to the side, oh, there he went, and then he'd look back, oh, I got to keep going again. Whoa. You end up with a really zigzaggy, curvy furrow. You don't want that as a farmer. And this is what Jesus is saying in the metaphor. Make sure you have that target. Make sure you can see it clearly and keep your eyes on it. Keep, stay focused. You will be tempted to be distracted and to look here and there and down and, you know, to grab a swig of water, whatever it is you're trying to do. And, you're, and you, the next thing you know, you've gotten off track again. So focus on the finish line, Jesus said. Focus on the finish line. Don't look back. Keep looking forward. And I can tell you that the enemy, and we, we know that the enemy is alive and well. We know that. We've all experienced it. We've all seen it. The Bible is full of it in the New Testament, the Old Testament. It doesn't say anywhere in the New Testament that the enemy no longer is in existence, that the enemy no longer works. Just the opposite. The Bible is full of warnings about the enemy. And the enemy would love to get your eye off that target. So stay focused on their finish line. That's the first metaphor. The second one Paul gives is a runner running a race. In Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14, it says this. Paul said this. Not that I've all already obtained all this. Meaning he says, I haven't already arrived there. I haven't already arrived at my goal. But nevertheless, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to, ha to have taken hold of it. Meaning he has not yet finished. He's not yet come to the finish line. He's not been, he's not gotten there. And in truth, as long as we live, as long as we are breathing here on this earth, we will not have yet crossed the finish line. That is something we will not see in this day and age. The, the one that Paul is talking about, that particular goal. So he says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward toward what is ahead. I love that. Can't you just see it? Can't you see him as a runner? He's, you know, you've seen runners, right, when they try to cross that finish line and somebody's really close to them and they push, they strain, they keep going. They don't, when you are, if you are running a race, you don't get a foot be before the finish line and then say, oh, well, look how far I've gotten, and sit down and let everybody else cross the finish line, that would be silly. And yet we all do it all the time. We all do it all the time. No, he says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on. These are strong words that Paul uses. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul says in this metaphor, press on to the finish line I'm going to tell you today, just to help you remember in a nutshell, focus on the finish line and know where that finish line is. You know, I'm sure, you, you don't have to raise your hand, but I bet if I asked how many of you have heard of the basketball player Bill Bradley, most of you would raise your hand. 
I'm not a big sports aficionado, and I've heard of Bill Bradley, but he is one of the best basketball players to have ever played the game. And he was, when he was playing for Princeton, one time their, their court was being refurnished, and he wanted to stay in practice, so he took a friend of his, went to the local high school gym, and he began to practice his three-pointers, which he is really known for, being able to take that three-pointer ball and get, get it in the net every time. And so Bill did that. He started practicing like he was used to doing, and in, in the first one bounced off the rim. He was a little surprised, as his friend was. He tried again. He tried again. All three, three out of three of them, failed to go through the basket. His friend said, what's wrong with you? How can you be missing? And Bill said this, well, the rim is one and a half inches too low. He blamed the rim. Uh, you know, why not? Why not? Let's just try that. But he did. He blamed the rim. The rim is one and a half inches too low. His friend didn't believe him. So they got out a measuring tape and they measured and he was actually wrong. Bill was wrong. The basket was actually one and one quarter inch too low. He knows, he knew where his goal was. Didn't matter where he was on the court, he knew where his goal was. That's why he was able to be such a successful basketball player. We need to know where our goal is. If you know where your goal is, you're probably going to be more likely to hit it. That's just common sense. So we want to make sure we're focused on the right goal. Ah, uh, who of us wants to end up at the end of our life and find out that we've been going the wrong way? our whole life. We missed out on it. We don't want it, who, nobody wants that to happen. You know, our, one of our sons, our second son, he loved football, still does. And he thought that because he watched, watched football that he would like to play it. So he begged and begged to be signed up for Pop Warner. And we did. We signed him up for Pop Warner. He decided well into the, in the second season, early in the, the second season, I should say, that he liked watching it more than he liked playing it. But he still likes watching it. But I'll never forget the one time, the one game Jim and I went to go and watch, and we saw one of the kids, it wasn't Chris, I need to make sure I say that, but one of the kids um, picked up a ball that was fumbled and he began to run toward the, the end zone. And everybody started yelling at him because he was going the wrong way. He was going towards his opponent's goal Instead, you know, instead of his own, the one they were supposed to head for. And everybody's yelling at him, yelling at him, and he didn't hear them because he was so caught up and he was in the moment. And he crossed, he crossed that line and he thought he'd made a touchdown and he was so excited. Oh my gosh, I made a touchdown, only to learn no. Can you imagine how that would feel? And we don't want that to happen to us. But lest you think it only happens in Pop Warner. No, I found this. In 1963, in a game, and I'm going to read this because I'm not a sports aficionado, and I will probably say something wrong, and I'll hear about it from all you, you sports nuts out there. Sports fans, sorry. In 1963, in a game between the Minnesota Vikings and the San Francisco 49ers, Bill Kilmer was the 49er quarterback. He fumbled while being sacked in the backfield. Jim Marshall, Viking defensive end, picked up the, the ball and ran about 70 yards the wrong way into his own end zone for a safety against his team. Yes, a professional football player did this. Marshall threw the ball towards the stands in elation, not realizing what he had done. 49 offensive tackle Bruce Bosley ran up to him and patted him on the shoulder. Great play, Jim. Great play. So the, the whole point of this is make sure you know where the target is. If you're going to press into something, if you're going to give your life to something, make sure it's the right thing. Make sure of that. So... What is the finish line? You say, Sheila, what is the finish line? Are you going to tell me? Or are you going to make me figure it out for myself? Well, I'm not going to tell you. But 
Paul says it back in the verse we read in Philippians. He said, I press on toward the goal to win the prize, Christ Jesus. That's the goal. That's the target, Christ Jesus. Without Christ, we are like Lazarus in the tomb. Without Christ, we are left for dead. Without Christ, we have no meaning and no purpose. Without Christ, we have no hope. Christ is the finish line. Christ is the finish line. And Satan would love for you to take your focus off that goal. He would love to have you devote your life to other endeavors, even noble goals. And that doesn't mean, do not misunderstand me and think that that means that you have to be in full-time ministry. That is not what I'm saying at all. Because the Lord loves to put his people in the world, right smack dab in the middle of the secular world, to be lights to the people who are hurting. He wants to do that. So don't misunderstand me. But while you are there, know that this is your life's purpose to be a light for Jesus. And God, and, but he would like to take our focus, and I say ours. I remember I preceded this whole message with saying, God just really, I had, he put me through the fire this past week where I had to really wrestle personally with this. So I taught, I know whereof I'm speaking, and I can tell you, you can have victory. But if we are not careful, we can lose track of our finish line in the fog of the world's messages. If we're not careful, we can lose track of our finish line in the fog of the world's messages. Florence Chadwick, I don't know if you've heard of her, I hadn't, but as I was doing research for this message today, I learned of Florence Chadwick. She's actually called the queen of the channels and she was an American swimmer. And she was swimming trying to be the first woman to swim from the California coastline to Catalina back in 1954. She had several boats flanking her as she went out to swim because of the shark-infested waters. And I guess they, they are shark-infested. I don't know. A lot of you swim in these shark-infested waters and surf in them all the time, but that's what they said. She, had, she was flanked by a bunch of boats so that she wouldn't have, be attacked by sharks, or should they attack, they could carry her in very quickly. But just as, so it's a 26 mile swim, one mile from the coast of Catalina. We all been there? I think most of us here have been to Catalina at some point or other. One mile from Catalina, the fog rolled in and she couldn't see her finish line. It was too foggy, she couldn't see it. And she struggled and she struggled until finally she gave up. She didn't make it. She got in one of the boats and she said, I'm, I can't swim anymore. She gave up. Well, the fog, the fog, apparently, the thing about fog is it's so deceiving because it looks so harmless, doesn't it? It doesn't look like it can hurt you. But boy, it can hide your finish line, and it can hide the truth from you. And so the fog kept her from reaching her finish line. I'm happy to report that two months later, she tried the same crossing, this time no fog, and this time she was able to successfully cross because she was able to see her finish line. It's really important to focus on the finish line, focus on the finish line, focus on the finish line, and let and ask God to help you see it, to bring clarity. She was the first woman to swim the Catalina Ch Channel. She was the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. She set a time record each time. She was the first woman to, my feedbacking, is that a word? She was the first woman to swim across the, there I am. 
I'm feedbacking. Thank you, Scott. The Straits of Gibraltar, the Bosporus, and the Dardanelles. And that's, that's an amazing, an amazing accomplishment. She's down in the history books as the queen of the channels. But she almost didn't make it because the finish line became enshrouded by fog. So watch out. Just be aware. Just be aware of the fact that, that the world would love to, dis, to fog up that finish line to the point where you lose track of it and you don't cross. So we have three, two, I said there are three metaphors in scripture. The first one was Jesus with a farmer. The second one was Paul with a runner running the race to cross that finish line. The third one is also from Paul when he talks, he uses the metaphor of archery. Now this is a word we don't talk about a whole lot here, Hope Center of Christ, but it is a definite, definite part of our doctrine and what we believe and what we know to be true from God's word. Paul talked about sin. And the word he used whenever he talked about sin was hamartia. Hamartia. That's the Greek word for sin. And that means literally missing the mark. So if you're an archery person and you're trying to, to hit the target and you miss the mark, that's what Paul says is sin. Well, we want to, the, and, and of course the enemy wants to tempt us take our eyes off the target, so we miss it, right? When we're not focused on the target, we're going to miss it. So the whole point, this is, again, the scripture is saying, focus, focus, focus on that finish line. Focus, focus, focus on that target. Focus on that. These three, farm, these three metaphors, the farmer, the archer, the runner, they all teach us the importance of staying focused. Now, one of the biggest things you're going to have to fight if you want to stay focused, can you guess what it is? A distraction. Distractions. Most of you know that with my doctorate in education, I know a lot about ADD or ADHD. People call it different things. And, um, but when we, when, and when I work with kids who have ADD or ADHD, one of the things we have to work on is how to handle those distractions. Distractions can be very benign. Distractions can even be noble. But distractions can keep us from reaching the finish line. Distractions can keep us, take our focus off the finish line. They can take our focus off the target. And I'm here to tell you today, and it's something I've known about for a long time, and I have neglected to teach you this important lesson, that distractions are one of the enemy's prime weapons because it's very subtle. You don't really see it coming. And the next thing you know, you've gotten lost in the fog. You've missed the mark. You haven't, you've, you've given up on your goal or your dream on Christ because of a distraction. So your tomorrow starts today by focusing and being aware of the distraction because the distraction is one of the enemy's favorite weapons. Now, you, I haven't made you get out your Bibles yet today and don't think you get to get out of here without doing so. So take them out. And turn to Genesis chapter 11. Now I'll give you a moment to do that. Genesis. Everybody knows where that is. First book in the Bible. Genesis 11. Once you get to Genesis 11, go down to verse 31. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about a guy named Terah. And you've all heard of Terah, right? He's a common name in the Bible. And you can all write a little, if I asked you to write a little report on Terah, you could all do it, right? No. Has anybody in here even heard of Terah? No. Except for Cliff. But Cliff is, Cliff is a pastor, too. So that's how, that doesn't count, Cliff. But anyway, Terah. Here, Terah. Let's see who Terah was. Genesis 11:31. Terah took his son Abram. Oh, he's Abraham's dad. 
Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of his son Abram. Together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Oh, Canaan. Lest you not know what Canaan is, Canaan is the promised land. So here they are. Terah gets his son Abram, Abram's wife Sarah, Lot, and everything they own, and they set out to go to the promised land, right? That's their finish line. Let's see what happens. But, oh, don't you love that word? But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Verse 32 says very simply, Terah lived 205 years, and he died. Did he die in Canaan? Did he die in the promised land? He died in Haran. He died in Haran. Abraham's father got distracted and stopped. He missed out on the promised land. He settled. This is a great lesson for you and for me. Don't settle. Don't give up until you cross the finish line. Some of you have goals that you have, God has asked you to do, and you started and you ran into an obstacle, and suddenly you said, well, this is fine. I've accomplished this, and this is enough, so great. I'm just going to settle. But you haven't crossed the finish line. You haven't made it to the promised land. Don't be like Tara. Don't settle for anything but the promised land. Why would you? Why would you? The Lord has a promised land for each and every one of us, not necessarily a physical place, but a promised land which is walking, walking with Jesus and fulfilling the, our divine calling. In fact, I want to go back because I almost forgot to, and, I, and it's a great quote from John Calvin, tremendous theologian. He said this, as the runner requires to be free from entanglement and not stop his course on account of any impediment, but must continue his course, surmounting every obstacle, so we must take heed that we do not apply our mind, our heart, to anything that may divert the attention, but must, on the contrary, make it our endeavor that free from every distraction, we may apply the whole bent of our mind exclusively to God's calling. That is what, that's getting to the promised land. And Tara didn't get there. And that's not to say he didn't go to heaven or that we won't see him someday, you know. And maybe if you do, you can say to him, what, why? Why did you settle, Tara? I don't think you're going to want to do that. But you could, I guess. So at any rate, don't settle. Don't stop until you cross that finish line. All right, now, I hope you still have your Bibles open. Because there we have, we just finished chapter, Genesis chapter 11. That was the last verse of Genesis chapter 11, verse 32. Tara lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord, because the story continues, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So, Terah didn't do it. Terah failed to make it there. So what does God do? He raises up the son. He raises up Abram, and he says, okay, your father didn't do it, so you do it. And in verse 2, he gives Abram this promise, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. The Lord promises he will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. The Lord promises that we will, in turn, be a blessing to others. The Lord said, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Verse 4 said, so Abram went. Who? He got up. He left his father's house. That is not easy to do. Once you have settled, once you have you're, you've created a place where you're comfortable, where you know people. You might be in a job where everything is comfortable. You have everything you need. But the Lord is calling you to leave and go somewhere else. 
And that might be difficult to do. That takes a lot of faith. He doesn't necessarily call you to leave your family, but he does, he might. My parents were called to leave their family to come to California and start a ministry. But what if, what if my parents hadn't done that? What about all the millions of people who would never have known Jesus if they hadn't had the faith to get up and go and leave their, their parents, leave their family? God will call each and every one of us to do different things, but there are times when God will say, get up and leave your father's house. Get up and leave your father's house. Now, it says in verse 4, Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. 75 years old. Not a whole lot of you here in this room are 75 years old. Most of you are far younger. And, but even so, some of you might be thinking, I'm too old to start out. I'm too old to leave my father's house. I'm too old to do something new. I'm too old to go back to school. I'm too old to, to take on this new dream. Uh-uh-uh. No, no, no. That's a distraction. That's a distraction. Because your age doesn't matter. Your experience doesn't matter. Your gender doesn't matter. Your ethnicity doesn't matter. Those are all distractions that the enemy uses to try to derail you and take your focus off the goal and to get you to settle, to settle, to stay in Haran and miss out on the promised land. Well, let's see. Did I'm going to continue in verse 5. Abram took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they'd accumulated and the people they'd acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Here's the part I like. And they arrived there. Hooray, finally. Abram did it. He got to the promised land. This is, a, okay, you guys, let's give Abram a great big rounding applause. Let's just do it. I love this. Finally, yay. He did it. This is not an easy thing to do. This was an act of faith and boldness and courage and staying focused on the finish line. Abram arrived there. Because we see in verse 6 that Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Canaanites were their enemy. Some of you have enemies. You have obstacles. And now when I say enemies, you know what I'm talking about. Well, I'm not talking about enemies like necessarily terrorists. But I'm talking about, a, I hear it. And I've experience it myself, where you run into people a lot. Of, it might be a neighbor that you've got a conflict with. It might be a family member, extended or otherwise, that you have a conflict with. It might be um, a colleague who's actually coming against you and trying to sabotage your progress at work. It happens. But the reality is that your obstacles, Canaanites, even if they're in your life, that doesn't matter. They're just a distraction to take your eyes off the finish line. Stay focused on the finish line. Well, that's not the only illustration in the Bible about the importance of being aware of distractions. In Luke 10, you don't have to turn there, but you can if you want to. Luke 10, verse 38 through 42. Jesus went to a village, it says. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at her Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. And it says right here, but Martha was what? Distracted with much serving. Ah, I, you know, you've heard lots of messages about this. And you know what? I do tend to be a Martha. Um, but, and she went up to him. This is the part I, I can't imagine doing, but Martha went up to him and she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister who's sitting there at your feet listening to you teach, she's left me here all alone to serve you. Well, man, man. Tell her to help me. Come on. But the Lord said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing just one, but one thing is necessary. 
Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. What is that one thing sitting at the feet of Jesus? Just sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, there's nothing wrong with serving. Serving is also worship. But when it takes the place of sitting at the feet of Jesus, it becomes a distraction. And we miss out. We miss out on being fed, on being blessed. You can't serve when you're empty. You have to be fed. You have to take it. And counselors talk about, uh, and social workers, they talk about something called self-care. You have to take care of yourself. And you do that by sitting at the feet of Jesus as Christians. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to give you a very practical, pragmatic example of how I, Sheila, fall victim to the Martha every day. I have to fight it. I have to fight it. I have to fight it. Because that distraction seems very benign. It seems even noble. One of the first things I tend to do is I get up. Actually, when I'm lying in bed, before I get up, I go, oh, I'm going to get up. I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus, and I'm going to read the Bible, and I'm just going to pray. How wonderful to go and sit at the feet of Jesus. But my feet no sooner hit the ground, and I start walking into the kitchen, and I'm thinking, I better put the coffee on first. And then while the coffee's brewing, I'm thinking, Oh, gosh, I haven't posted a devotion on Facebook in a few days. I better go post a, a devotion on Facebook. So I sit down, and I start to post a devotion on Facebook, and I'm cr scratching my head and going, I'm really having trouble coming up with something. <laughs> but I, I, I force my way through, and I post that devotion on Facebook, and I go, and then I'm, I think, now I'll go read, I'll go back, and I'll do sit at the feet of Jesus. Wait a minute, somebody just left a comment. i got to go see what they said. Gosh, it's already got three likes yesterday. How many did I get yesterday? And so it goes. Then I look at the clock and I go, oh, my word, the doorbell's going to ring in 10 minutes. My students are going to be here, and I'm sitting here in my bathrobe. So I race to get ready, you know, and hopefully the doorbell doesn't ring. And, and the next thing I know, my day is well on its way, and I haven't had that time of sitting at the feet of Jesus. Distractions. They are weapons. That's what they are. They're weapons. So how do you fight them? Very quickly, very simply. Number one, be aware. Be aware. This may be the first time you've ever heard this. I learned the lesson several years ago, and I should have taught it to you earlier. I know that. I realize that as your pastor, and I apologize for that. I guess I got distracted. <laughs> but the, but the, the whole point is distractions are, are there. And if you're aware of them, that's half the battle. It really is. i got to be able to tell you that, that there are times when, I, when I'm fighting against something or things aren't getting done or I, I feel myself and, um, getting down or discouraged or suddenly I'll go, oh, Sheila, you're, it's a distraction. That's all it is. Sometimes when somebody says something to me that's hurtful and it, it starts to, I, and again, I start to feel farther away from God, I go, it's because of a distraction. It's just a distraction. And I want you to hear that word, just. Just, right? Like the fog. It's just fog. It's just a distraction. And it can't hurt you unless you don't address it, unless you don't say, recognize it. So first of all, you want to be aware that that's how the enemy loves to get at God's children, is through these distractions. Secondly, remember, you have victory. You have victory. You don't have to fight this. You don't have to fight the distractions. You can't fight them on your own. You just have to say, like we said earlier, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And he will. And I can tell you, I do that. There are times when I've had to say, and, and, 
like I said, the Lord really worked on me this past week, and there are times I had to say, Lord, save me. And the other one is recognizing that it's a weapon against from the enemy, and there's that scripture verse that you can say aloud that says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. The minute you say that, the minute you recognize it, I can tell you the focus goes right back to where it needs to be on Christ. Christ. The he's the finish line. Yes, he gives us divine dreams and divine goals to do here on earth for him. But don't even let those become a distraction from Christ. He is the finish line. He is the one and true thing, like Jesus said, the one thing that's necessary. One thing, and that's Christ. Holy Spirit, we ask you today to clear the fog, clear the fog from our eyes so we can see you. Oh, Lord, help us to see that finish line just as clear as a bell. Help us to know today that we need to run to you. We don't want to come to the end of our line and fi- our life and find out that we've missed. We've been running to the wrong finish line. I mean, we want to see you. We want to run to you. We want to press on towards the goal, which is you. We want to do that every day of our life with every fiber of our being because you are life. We find our life in you, in sitting at your feet. We do it not because we need to to earn our salvation. Oh, no, no, you've done all that for us. All you want us to do is to sit at your feet in gratitude and just to soak up your love and your forgiveness and your life. So we do that now. We just sit at your feet right now. And we look into your face like Mary did. And do that one thing that's necessary. And that's thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving us. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for us. Thank you, Jesus for life. Thank you. Amen. pray that all of you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But in case you haven't, I just want to lead all of us in a prayer. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving my life. I want to live for you. Starting today. Starting today. Right here. Right here. Right now. Right now. Amen. Amen. If that's the first time you've ever prayed that prayer, please talk to one of us pastors after church. Next week, Pastor Jim will be back. He, he's anxious to see you all. And um, now will you stand for the benediction? And thank you for coming today to Hope Center of Christ. You bless us. Bless us with your presence. 
So now I'm going to stand up here where you can see me a little bit. Try not to block beautiful Jessica and everybody else. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Oh, may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace that passes all understanding. May he give you faith that is unshakable. May he give you hope that is unsinkable and love that is unquenchable. Focus on Christ this week. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Pastor Sheila said, no weapon formed against you or me shall prosper. And it goes on to say, any word spoken against you, you shall condemn. In the name of Jesus, you will have the victory. Anything that's a distraction, you just said, I will have the victory in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, that's what we're going to leave with. You're going to have the victory this week.
take that this week and you tramp on the devil's head yes, and Lord. you walk in victory. Hallelujah. Get rid of those distractions yes, and take the promised land in your life this week. We'll see you next week. God bless you, Hope Hallelujah. Center.